In the last video, we took a deep dive into Power Rangers Dino Thunder. But we're not going to waste too much time here. We're going to dive straight in, headfirst, into Bakuyu Sentai Abba Ranger and see what the Japanese show has to offer. Join me, won't you? We start with the Black Ranger riding a Raptor Zord through a desert-like area. Although, straight away, we get a fully CG-rendered ranger mixed in with practical effects. A portal opens up and a battle ensues, but an alien ship, along with the Black Ranger's cargo, is pulled through. We then switch to a museum where a mechanised dinosaur bursts through the walls and scares the Night Watchman half to death. Add Jurassic Park 2 vibes to the list. But it's not the only one. Dinosaurs are attacking loads of areas of Tokyo, causing destruction in CG reminiscent of the original 1995 Power Rangers movie. Although, again, they do also mix in practical effects as well. The Black Ranger lands after making his trip through the portal, making reference to this being another Earth, suggesting he's now in a different dimension. He recognises the Tyranno mech, but isn't able to bring it under control. Well, yeah, that's what I've been saying. We get glimpses of a few characters, who we can assume are going to be our new rangers, as well as an older guy, each oddly hearing a distant voice. The dinosaurs continue to rampage, with evacuations of apartment buildings, but the voices they're hearing are the voices of the dinosaurs themselves crying out for help. The Black Ranger continues to search for great warriors who have dino guts. I guess it could be the equivalent of blood of a dino warrior, or a dino warrior's heart, but nope, they say dino guts, so that's what we're going with. Two of the people who are able to hear the voices are led to the Black Ranger, or now as we know him, Asuka. Not that one. He tells them that the enemy are using the dinosaurs to cause destruction, but that's not true to their hearts, assuming they're not just mechanical, that is. We're introduced to Emmy and Ryunsky, which inevitably I'm going to be mispronouncing, but thankfully Emmy shortens it to just Ski, so that's what I'll be calling him. Emmy is to be our new Yellow Ranger, and Ski, despite his age, is to be our new Blue Ranger. So, there's hope for us all still. Meanwhile, on the alien ship, or should I say the Evolian ship, we get a glimpse of a character we would know as Zeltrax. He briefly monologues about the motivation for him to destroy the Earth, as this somehow leads them onto a path of prosperity. But alas, Emmy and Ski aren't able to handle the power that being a ranger brings, so we're introduced to Yukito and Ranru, both of whom are able to take back control of the Zords. I'll use the word Zords, but obviously that's the American word for them. Now, although Emmy and Ski can't become rangers, at one point, Emmy sort of becomes an honorary ranger, claiming that she's the Pink Ranger, although that's just a homemade costume in an episode where she tries to convince her parents that she can't move away. Incidentally, seeing as she doesn't have a dinosaur, she ends up adopting the Pig, a reference to when she does actually try to make herself transform, but ends up turning herself into a Pig. But an interesting difference is that, in this version, the Morphers act as a means of communicating with the Zords beyond just talking to them. The Zords are actually able to talk back. The Evolian is apparently wearing the armour of Asuka's people, although he's supposedly not one of them, suggesting that Asuka's people, back in the other dimension, have all been killed. Our would-be Red Ranger turns up, but is seemingly eaten, but no, he manages to morph, or transform I suppose, and the rangers are able to take up their dino weapons. Which are more or less the same as in the US show, although the Red Ranger staff has more of a snake feel to it. Which wasn't really utilised in the US show, even though the toy line allowed it to bend and fold like a snake. The rangers can also power themselves up like in the US show, but to do so they have to get angry and tap into their dinosaur instincts. Although, there's not much difference between the three of them in the US show. It's just Kira that's able to glide like a pterodactyl. But in this case, because they're channeling their respective dinosaurs, we also see the Blue Ranger acting like a Triceratops, and the Red Ranger acting like a Tyrannosaurus Rex. 
As such, the name Abba Ranger is meant to be derived from barbaric, although that's later changed so that it comes from the name of their suits, Attack Battle Resistance Suits, or ABR, Abba. Not that one. But also, the word Abare in Japanese supposedly means rampage, as we learn from the opening theme. And finally, we're introduced to the Brachiosaurus, the Carrier Zord. Which, by the way, we can later see why we got a glimpse of it emerging from a lake in Power Rangers, as that's where the Zords wait until they're needed. This new band of warriors head back to their new secret base, which is actually Ski's restaurant. Asker explains that this Earth and his world were once one 65 million years ago. A meteor hit the planet and split it into two dimensions. On Asker's Earth, the dinosaurs were never made extinct and evolved alongside humans to develop emotions and intelligence. So, pretty much Super Mario Bros. the movie. What if the dinosaurs weren't all destroyed? What if the impact of that meteorite created a parallel dimension where the dinosaurs continue to thrive and evolve into intelligent, vicious, aggressive beings? However, some were able to evolve into the dinosaurs of today, as he puts it, or basically the Zords. But that means that these aren't just Zords, they have feelings, emotions, and a voice. They're living beings with organic tissue. In fact, they're much more like companions than they are in the US show, where they're essentially just robots. At some point, the Evolians appeared in the Dino Dimension and aimed at the destruction of his Earth, and now this Earth too. Speaking of Evolians, unlike the US show where Zeltrax never removes his armour, we get our first proper look at Gyreton, the Apostle of Darkness, as well as the Apostle of Destruction, Janna. While we technically have a full Ranger lineup, the Blue Ranger initially refuses, as he makes a fortune as a famous chiropractor and sees no incentive in fighting for free. But with the Evolian ship causing massive destruction, and also with his brand new Porsche destroyed, he rejoins the lineup, and now that all three Rangers are together, they are able to fuse the three dinosaurs to form Aberen O, or the Megazord. To control it, they channel their thoughts and feelings through the control panel in front of them, while the dinosaurs communicate to them through their braces. With a little bit of ingenuity, Aberen O is able to destroy the Evolian ship, and the Blue Ranger proves that he's not a complete soul by helping a young boy to retrieve his lost model car from the ruins, and he also agrees to give it a shot. We also learn all of their real names, Ryuga, Ranru, and Yukito, and I apologise for probably mispronouncing all of them. Which, side note, Ryuga is also the legal guardian for his niece, and also the cutest little girl ever, Mai. But then Gaiaton is killed by his sister for his failure, and we introduce a whole new host of villains. The Apostle of Creation, Michaela, the Apostle of Infinity, Vofa, and the Apostle of Dawn, Rija. Only Rija isn't all she appears. Throughout the first dozen or so episodes, she keeps switching between cute and sweet, and a green-eyed monster. We'll come back to this. It's kind of hard to fathom what they all do, but they're all essentially artists, be it a musician, a painter, etc. And that's how they create their monsters. They're called trinoids, or trinoids, and they're not completely random like they are in Power Rangers. They're made up of three constituent parts, an inanimate object, an animal, and a plant. Like in Power Rangers, they are regenerated and grow through rain, but more specifically, it's from a rain cloud caused by a seed that contains a regenerating bacteria. These are generated by Michaela, the painter, but then there's also giganoids that are giant from the beginning and are composed by Voffa and named after musical compositions. I can understand why they simplified this for the US show. But with a monster attacking the city, we learn that Asker isn't able to use his morphing brace, as there are more dinosaurs that are missing. Now, it's good that we covered the SBD episode, set in 2025, because in episode 4 of Abba Ranger, we move forward in time to 2023, and inevitably, the technology is way ahead of what we could actually expect in this version too. 
A scientist receives a phone call from Sweden to say he's to receive the Nobel Prize, and apparently he owes it all to a woman who he doesn't even know, although we would know as Ranru. When we switch back to 2003, Ski unveils what he's been up to at the restaurant. The kitchen area has been turned into a ridiculously high-tech command centre, with a computer system linked to every surveillance camera in the country. And it's a good thing too, because remember, this is Japan, where violence in kids shows isn't as censored, and there's a f***ing sniper picking off innocent people. Seriously, look at this. Anyway, it's a relatively nothing episode, but it ends with Ranru coming up with a concept for how the monster is able to fly, and that somehow helps our would-be Nobel Prize winner in the future. And so it highlights that Ranru is in fact a genius, something that had already been hinted at, but actually gets dropped for the majority of the season. And actually, this doesn't involve time travel at all, but I mention it because the tech is still more advanced than we could expect for 20 years after this is set, and one year from now, but then again, I guess an instant video chat from Sweden to Japan is easy enough these days, so at least they do a better job of it than Power Rangers did. It also introduces the rideable raptors, which are utilised a lot more than in the US show, with more fleshed out sequences. Well, not flesh, but CG. You know what I mean. Now, not that it has anything to do with the comparisons with the US show, but episode 5 features Yukito using his chiropractic skills on a Formula 4 driver who was injured in a crash. So it seems only appropriate to juxtapose that with footage of me also crashing in Formula 4. And of course, how can we resist? We also learn that Gaiaton isn't dead after all, so we think. And not only that, but Asuka finds an egg for one of the missing dinosaurs that we alluded to in the first episode. But Janna is looking for them too. Episode 6 is our first mirrored episode from Power Rangers. In Dino Thunder, Kira goes to meet an old friend who's become a famous singer, only to find out she's become a massive diva and a sellout and is then aged by a monster, whereas in Abba Ranger, we learn that Ranru was once an idol, and she takes Ryuga to meet an old friend, who's also become a famous idol too, only to be aged by a monster. Incidentally, this is pretty similar to an episode of Ginga Man, with a monster stealing young girls' youths, except this monster gets an upset stomach, and sh**s out of his eyes. I don't know where to go with that one. And I'm not even going to touch the episode where a guy keeps trying to kill himself. But anyway, the egg hatches into a baby Pachycephalosaurus, or Baki for short, thankfully with a B and not a P. Although, unlike in Power Rangers, he can't be used straight away. He grows up as we go along, and can eventually join with Abereno to form a power punch attack. Inside the egg is an orb that provides nutrients for when it's growing, and these can apparently be used to fix Asuka's transforming brace. Also, the warrior that we thought was Gaiaton is actually Janna, but Asuka recognises her as someone else called Mahoro. Janna apparently killed her and is now using her body as a puppet, so Asuka transforms to battle her, but for some reason his body is weak. And apparently Saurians, or Saurians, I think that's how it's said, I can't find an actual proper pronunciation, they have the claw marks on their cheeks, but these can also be used to telepathically communicate with each other through touch. This is reserved for people in relationships, I guess a bit like the tails in Avatar, but Janna does it to Asuka and he worries that she's read his mind. It's not until the following episode that he's able to regain his strength and rampage. It's at this point he's able to use the powers of his Dino Thruster, which are essentially the same as what we saw in Power Rangers, but we do see it a bit more often, and with additional abilities too. Episode 10 is the one that we've been waiting for. This is the episode we saw redubbed in Dino Thunder. In this episode we learn that Rija does indeed have an evil entity inside of her. Now, different translations call it different things, and this season is by far 
the hardest for pronunciations of names, so for the sake of everyone not having to cringe at my mispronunciation, I'm just going to call it Desmo. And this might explain why she acts a bit strange when the monsters are defeated. There are similarities between what the US show shows and what's actually in the Japanese show. In the dub, the show starts with the character that we would know as Yukito making a disgusting fruit salad curry, which they force their unwitting customer to try, but then Mikey, or Asuka, ends up eating it until he has to throw up. Which, to be fair, despite the cheesy dubbing, is exactly what happens in Abba Ranger. Except we would know the unwitting customer as Mr. Yoki, who kind of just eats curry and gets drunk throughout the series. He doesn't really have much purpose other than that. It's just that in the US show, parts of the Japanese show are condensed and that it has an overall cheesier feel because of the American voices. However, it's worth pointing out that they end up dubbing the American baseball player character in the Japanese show as well. Oh, Japan, that was a long trip. And that's because we've actually seen this guy before. He played Pop, the iNet technician in Mega Ranger. I pointed out then that it's weird that we have this more Western looking character that gets dubbed over in English anyway, but the reason is because he's not actually American at all, he's Ghanaian, and presumably wasn't able to nail the accent. So actually, it sounds more natural than in the US show. But essentially the concept of this show is the same. A mushroom teddy bear cash machine monster turns up and gives everyone mushroom shaped haircuts for the sole purpose of laughing at them. Meanwhile, Yukito gets to work fixing a pro baller's injured hip, and pretty much everything is the same. It's all about the mushroom wigs making everyone obsessed with money. Some small things are changed, but it's more so so that it fits the timing of the show. So yes, the American show did ham it up quite a lot, but this is just an objectively weird episode, even in its original form. And the point of the US show was to highlight how Japanese TV shows can appear strange to Western audiences on first appearance. Often people do see them as just over the top and silly, as it appeared in Power Rangers. The moral of the episode was to realise that just because something might seem strange to you at first doesn't mean it's not good, which is kind of the point of these videos as well, so I'd say they nailed it. And can we just reiterate how cute Mai is? As the show goes on, they discover more of the missing dinosaurs, the first being the Dimetrodon, who makes an entrance like the giant saw from The World Is Not Enough. Who's not gonna like this? Initially, he's under Janna's control, but is reminded of who he is when Asuka plays his dino harmonica. And again, as in the US show, he's able to combine with Aberen O as another weapon. And then that's followed by the Stegosaurus, but this is interesting because it complicates things more than the US show does. Seeing as the auxiliary dinosaurs are meant to be able to talk and communicate with the rangers as well, it means that their braces need to constantly change so that they're able to communicate properly. And of course, let's just take a moment to appreciate the monster that is basically the bikers from South Park. Throughout the show, Janna is haunted by a girl that looks just like Rija, although the significance of this doesn't become apparent until much later. In episode 17, we start to learn what happened to Asuka on Dino Earth. He grew up in a war zone with the Evolians conquering the planet. Much of the first half of the season is him recovering from memories attached to his past life. But also we're introduced to our White Ranger. Although technically he's not called the White Ranger, it's more like the Killer Ranger, or Abare Killer. Although interestingly in the South Korean dub of Abare Ranger, he is called Dino White. We then get a flashback to the day when the dinosaurs were first transported to this Earth. While they were running riot, the Abare Killer was transfixed. He'd grown tired of his life as a surgeon, but he's also able to hear the dinosaurs call for help. He rushes to their aid, but Ranru and Yukito beat him to it. Only he's disappointed that they turn good, and jealous that Ryuga is chosen to yield the powers of the dinosaur over him. But when the Evolian ship was destroyed by Aberen O, 
another Transformer and Egg fell to the ground. Although initially he's unable to handle the power, a little bit like Emmy and Ski. So he watches from a distance until he's eventually able to control it and become Abba Ray Killer, to a strength where he can have his fun destroying the other rangers. Desmo orders Janna to go after him as it's too big a risk to have something that was once in their possession potentially used against them too. Only Asuka recognises Abare Killer as something else. He refers to him as Zero, as he wears the prototype brace that should have been destroyed as it was unstable. So I guess this is a little bit like the Silver Ranger in Mega Ranger. Although rather than that just being the transformation failing, it has the potential to also cause an explosion powerful enough to destroy a whole city. And rather than wanting to destroy the rangers, he just wants to be a Loki-style character causing mayhem through playing games. Janna tries to take the brace and egg from him, but little does she know that the egg is just about ready to hatch, but requires energy, or dino guts, from fighting the other rangers. The reason why Zero is so strong is because the initial idea was to create one almighty warrior, but absolute power corrupts absolutely, so it was decided to have four Abba Rangers fighting rather than just one. But to partner the ultimate warrior, not that one, was also the ultimate partner, a dinosaur called Top Gala, a Tupuhuara, or a pterodactyloid. But before Top Gala hatches, we're introduced to the Parasaur, who explains that he landed on the other side of the world, off the coast of Chile, and has only just made it to Japan. And as such, he talks in sort of a Mexican-esque accent, and speaks in a mix of Japanese and Spanish. When Top Gala does finally hatch, he begins to grow almost instantly, and, as in Power Rangers, they're able to take control of the Stegosaurus. The two dinosaurs combine to form Killer-O, Although, interestingly, the Stegosaurus can still be heard resisting, and is actually able to free himself without the aid of the rangers. Only, he's seduced by the power, as he's only a small cog in Aberen O, but he's a vital component in Killer O, so he returns to see what he can do on the other side. And in actual fact, he ends up forming an even more powerful version of Killer O, which actually does the rangers a favour by destroying an incredibly strong Giganoid. Whilst at the hospital recovering from his injuries, Ryuga discovers the identity of their new foe, a doctor called Makoto, who previously performed a life-saving operation on Ryuga. But Ryuga's attempts to bring him onto the side of good don't go down too well. And not only does he continue to be a lone ranger, no pun intended, but he also steals his own monster, whose name is almost impossible to pronounce, because it's a trinoid mashup, but the subtitles tend to call him Telefatsen dial, so that's what I'll go with. He ends up becoming somewhat of a butler type, and is also the comic relief for a lot of the series. And is also essentially my spirit animal when watching some of these seasons. <laughs> but we're still not done introducing dinosaurs. We still have the Ankylosaurus, who's able to tap into Asuka's brace and give clues as to where he is, Except he's just kind of an asshole and sends them on wild goose chasers until he decides that he wants to make an appearance. But he doesn't actually want to get involved with the other dinosaurs, he just wants to have fun, which leads to a Megazord style tug of war until he finally changes his mind, combining with Abereno to form another shield slash weapon upgrade. But Aberray Killer continues to play games, taking control of other dinosaurs as the season goes on. And there's not a lot that the other rangers can do about it, because fighting him risks the brace causing a devastating explosion. So at this point, Desmo realises that it might not be worth trying to battle two enemies at once. The Evolian's opportunity may come when the two eventually wear each other out. So much so that Michaela and Voffa end up killing time by visiting this version of Earth, an episode which just happens to include Yakoto dressed as a high school girl, which, if that's what he wants to do, not to mention the gratuitous upskirt shot, because Japan. Now episode 26 is interesting, because it's a two-part crossover with the anime Suribaka Nishi, a long-standing series of manga, anime and live-action movies about a bumbly fisherman. 
In the episode of ABBA Ranger, Ryuga and Mai tune into an episode of Suribakanishi after a fishing trip of their own. Meanwhile, the Evolians make a monster based on the character from the show, the Fishing Fool, who captures people and traps them in his jar in the form of olives. It's not really important why it's olives, but at least in the Japanese show we kind of understand why, being that the trinoids are part plant. In the US show, they still use a TV fisherman from a kid's show, but why the monster turns them into olives is completely unclear. In this episode, we also see a showdown between Janna, in the Saurian armour, and Abare Killer, as she's still pursuing the brace, only it starts to finally fail him. Essentially what we saw in Power Rangers as Zeltrax and the White Ranger fighting for position. Now, in creation of the monster, a dimensional door is opened, which starts affecting things in the TV show as well, with the fisherman's son, Koitaro, also being caught. So the anime starts speaking to the rangers through the TV, breaking the fourth wall and saying that Koitaro is a big fan of the show as he watches each week. The father begs them to save Koitaro, so they set out in search of the monster, bringing the TV along as a means of communicating with Hamachan. Just as it looks like they might lose the fight, Hamachan crosses through the dimensional door, out of the TV and into the real world, or at least into the Abba Rangers world. He manages to hook the jar away from the monster so that they can destroy him without harming those that he has hostage. And then after the inevitable mecha battle, everyone is freed, including Koitaro, so they're able to return through the TV. How any of that is possible is left purposely ambiguous, but still a fun episode. Now, unfortunately, the anime episode is almost impossible to find in the West, and doesn't appear to be on DVD, VHS or any other physical format. So, I had to VPN into a site in Japan to purchase a digital copy, despite not understanding what on earth I was doing, and having to somehow get around needing a Japanese address. Unfortunately, no subtitles exist for the show, not even in Japanese, never mind English. So, I hired an interpreter. Her name was Junko, lovely woman, born in Japan, now lives in London. But anyway, in the episode, the fish in Tokyo Bay aren't biting, and the rumour is that there's a monster that's been scaring them off. Seeing as he's not been able to go fishing, Hamachan spends a rare Sunday morning at home and finds Koitaro obsessed with a show on TV called Abba Ranger. As a treat, they take him to see the live show, a bit like the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers show that toured the US in the early 90s. We'll get to that one. Back in work, both Hamachan and his boss are exhausted because their kids insisted on playing Abba Rangers all weekend. Meanwhile, the CEO has accidentally promised that he will fix the problem in Tokyo Bay. While he doesn't necessarily believe that there is actually a monster, he asks Hamachan if he will go out on a fishing boat and see if he can catch it. He does actually nearly capture the monster, but then the Abba Rangers turn up, even though they're not meant to be real, they're just meant to be characters from a TV show. They then fight the monster, but when the boss is dragged into the water, the Fisherman Ranger appears. They agree to fight together, and the boss is used as bait to lure the monster out. The rangers then use their weapons to do away with him for good, but it turns out that it was all a dream. Hamachan was just hit in the head trying to catch the fish, and dreamt the whole thing about the rangers. Whether the monster was real or not, we don't know, but either way, the fish return to Tokyo Bay. Now, the two episodes are actually completely independent of each other, so you don't need to watch both. But what's strange is that the Abba Rangers exist in the Surabakanishi universe as a TV show, and Surabakanishi appears in the Abba Rangers universe as a TV show, but Hamachan and Koitaro are transported into the Abba Ranger universe, whereas the Abba Rangers aren't transported into the Surabakanishi universe, they already exist there as actors in a show, and then the team up is done in a dream. Now, we do actually have to take a break from the TV show at this point. The reason being is that there's actually a short film that aired at some point in the summer of 2003. I'm not entirely sure where it fit within the schedule, but there's events that happen in the show, and it's important because there's something that appears later on which won't make sense without understanding what happens here first. A little bit like the sudden appearance of Interpol in the Japanese Spider-Man series. 
The movie starts showing Dino Earth 15 years in the past. A terrible blizzard had been encapsulating everything in a deep freeze, brought about by some evil dinosaurs. But a princess poured her life force into a sword which sealed them away, along with herself, to protect all of Dino Earth's inhabitants. The story fascinates a young boy called Aska. Not that one. That one. We then switch to the Antarctic on our Earth in the present day, and some of the finest voiceover work I've ever heard in my life. That must be the iceberg that appeared half a year ago. Yeah, that's it. Ah! Regardless, the iceberg breaks, and the evil dinosaurs foretold in the story break free. I have no idea why they're on this Earth and not Dino Earth, though. It's later explained that the Evolians sent the iceberg to this Earth six months ago, but not explained why they did that. It's just kind of accepted, so they're here now. But anyway, while the rangers are all enjoying summer vacation, they're approached by someone who has saurian claw marks on her face. But before they can establish who she is, a set of monsters appear and demand that she's handed over. A lot of information is thrown at us in the next minute or so, but essentially, this is a hexanoid monster, as it's made up of six things, not three. One of those things is a bikini, so with a wave of a hand, everyone is magically wearing a bikini. There's also a bee and the Venus de Milo. So she sends out a bunch of bee stingers that then turns Emmy into a statue. Okay, I know, but just go with it. Trust me, it's not the only weird thing that happens in this episode. Yukito even gets shrunk down into a miniature, and we get this beautiful moment. But we're not going to get bogged down with that. So, the Evolians are after the woman as she's carrying the legendary sword from the story. Not only that, but she's the princess that sealed it away, too. She was sealed away 15,000 years ago, but the sword is broken and its power has been drained, hence why the evil dinosaurs are now roaming free. She needs power, or dino guts, to power it back up, and to find the other half of the blade too. But again, there's no real explanation as to why she's on this Earth and not Dino Earth. Cue some more amazing acting. What's this? Snow at the tropics? Shut the lock! The evil dinosaurs start making their way around the Earth towards Japan, bringing a great freeze along with them. Janna also makes an appearance, trying to prevent them from finding the other half of the sword. Because it turns out that the other half of the sword had actually been discovered, and was going to appear on a TV show that just happens to be filmed in the building of the station that airs Abba Ranger. That's pretty cheap. On the other side of town, Mini Yukito enters the Hexanoid and destroys her from the inside, and then Makoto turns up, trying to take possession of the sword. But it turns out that it wasn't the princess after all. It's a dimensional drifter who tricked the rangers into reviving the power of the sword, and planning on making the evil dinosaurs his slaves. As such, all the dinosaurs, including Top Gala and Stego, turn up, leading to an all-out battle, with the evil dinosaurs freezing the landscape all around them, and forming Baccaren O, an alternative form of the Megazord, and toy that I now desperately want. At one point, it even cuts off Aberen O's arm and merges it with itself. It takes all of the dinosaurs merging together to form Killer Aberen O and defeat both Baccaren O and the Drifter, returning Earth back to summer weather and Emmy back to her beautiful bikini clad self. In episode 28, we get another glimpse of Asuka's backstory. He actually married Mahoro, the woman whose body Janna now inhabits. The next day, they went their separate ways to infiltrate the Evolian base, and it didn't end well. But we find out that Rija is Janna's daughter. Asuka doesn't remember anything because he used a forbidden power, and the armour that we recognise from Janna and Gaiaton. The spirit of Rija's alter ego tries to help him remember, along with Brachia. You see, the armour gave him great power and strength, but it poisoned his virtuous heart because it only had the power to destroy. But the only way of removing the armour is to be killed, and the killer then inherits the cursed armour. At this point in the story, no one knows how Asuka lost the armour back then, and why he's still alive. Although it does beg the question, why did he not have to defeat someone to use it in the first place? 
In the meantime, Rija and Makoto kind of get into a relationship. It's something to do with Desmo wanting his host to give birth to a new physical form for himself, but that means you essentially have a young girl trying to seduce a grown man. She says she's just waiting to grow up and have a nice body. She even tries to stretch herself so that she can be ready to have babies sooner. That's... Hmm... And Makoto's just as bad. He flat out says in one episode that when she's an adult, he'll have a use for her. That's not okay. And it's definitely not okay to put in a kid's show. Like, not even close to being okay. Rija brings him back to the Evolian base on Dino Earth, where he immediately tries to take over. He even starts making his own monster. In order to fight Aberray Killer, now that he's able to rampage as well, and his monster, and now also to make up for the damage that he caused, Asuka uncovers a stone which contains a new power in the form of a shield. With the infusion of their combined dino guts, Abared is able to become Abare Max. However, Janna refuses to let Makoto have the glory of defeating the Abarangers, so she takes control of the new mech created by Voffa in the form of kind of a giant centipede. But still the spirit of the young girl haunts Asuka and Janna. We learn that when Mahoro and her brother stormed the Evolian base, her brother was seemingly killed and Desmo captured her and convinced her that Asuka abandoned them and shacked up with someone else. Desmo impregnates her with his child, but Mahoro and her brother are transformed into their current selves, Janna and Gaiatan, who managed to steal the armour. In the battle against the giant centipede, Ryuga becomes Abare Max, and calls upon a new dinosaur, the legendary Styracosaurus. As in the US show, it's not just a dinosaur, it also pulls a chariot behind it, and is able to form its own Megazord form, Maxorgia. In later episodes, this is able to merge with all other Minozords to form Max Ryuo. Meanwhile, Janna battles Asuka, but when the armour is destroyed, He's able to see that she still wears the wreath bracelet that he gave her as an engagement present. She could never bring herself to remove it, but can't forgive the man that abandoned her. Only he tells her that he didn't, and shows her that he still carries the locket she gave him before the attack on the Evolian base began. She then faints, unable to process what she's hearing. When she awakes, she's Mahoro again, but it can't last. She's been corrupted by Desmo, and Janna is the dominant personality. Unable to save her, Asuka strikes her down, but seemingly dies himself after the ship explodes. Makoto finds his harmonica in the wreckage, and Brachia appears on Ryuga's brace. But Janna, or Mahoro, survived and escapes with the rangers to Ski's restaurants. Not only that, but Desmo makes an appearance, clearly not satisfied with Rija's choice of suitor, threatening that when he returns, Makoto will meet his end. Back at the restaurant, Mahoro struggles to remember anything that's happened to her. She doesn't even remember who she is. Asuka also returns, seemingly having survived the explosion, by donning the Saurian armour. Presumably he was able to do so because technically Janna was killed, even though Mahoro wasn't. But it's clearly corrupted his mind again, if indeed it is him, because at this point we're not so sure. In episode 37, the spirit of the young girl we saw leaves Rija, and the girl that's left behind suddenly transforms into an adult, who renames herself Rijul. Well, technically I think it's Rijel, but most texts refer to her as Rijul, so that's what I'll be going with. The young girl is able to free herself, and initially inhabits Mai, but then eventually starts haunting the restaurant. However, as we go on, she just then becomes another member of the team. In the same episode that Emmy becomes the honorary Pink Ranger, Asuka returns proper and Mahoro's memories begin to return too, but he's still struggling with the effect of the armour. He tries to run, but is ambushed by Abare Killer, only the power of the armour is too strong. Mahoro tells Asuka that she remembers, but he's not really Asuka anymore. The most that he's able to do is refrain from killing her, cutting her engagement band. Only as a result of that, she goes to Makoto and asks him to allow her to return to the form of Janna, promising he can have the final blow in the battle against Asuka, meaning that the armour would pass to him. 
One touch of the Desmo tree, and she's Janna again, and Makoto has no time for a duel being jealous. The Rangers try to break the power of the armour by playing Asuka's Dino Harmonica to him. It nearly works, but the power is still too strong. So at this point in the story, the Rangers actually seem quite weak. Rajul is extremely powerful, Janna has returned, Abare Killer is as strong as ever, and Asuka is rampaging in the strongest armour of all. As such, they summon as much Dino Guts power as they can to rip through a monster, but not before Asuka is defeated and the armour leaves him, meaning that Makoto is now able to possess the armour of darkness, only it fails him. We don't really know why, but Janna assumes that Asuka's Dino Guts must have somehow contained its power. But Mahoro still exists within Janna. During the battle, their claw marks touched, and Asuka was able to see that Mahoro sacrificed them being together in order to save him from the armour. She'd become Janna again in order to free him and destroy the armour, but she's actually split. She's in the form of Janna, but Mahoro hasn't been erased. She's still there. But it turns out that the ultimate villain of the show isn't far from being revived. Ever since Rija transformed into Rajul, Desmo hasn't really been showing himself. But in the Christmas episode, we find out that there is actually another form. Because when the Earth split into Dino Earth and what the Evolians call another Earth, the meteor that caused it contained Desmo. As such, he too was split into two forms. So somewhere on our Earth is a human that is possessed by Desmo, just as Rija was, or still is. Can you guess who that person is? But seeing as this is getting incredibly complicated, before we move on, it is imperative that we remind ourselves that Mai is just impossibly cute. Anyway, after realising that Makoto is also at the point of no longer being able to handle the power of his brace, or Dino Minder as they call it, and will probably die soon, the Stegosaurus contacts the other rangers to warn them, as it's also in their best interest to not have Makoto morph too many times, because he could potentially explode with devastating effects. Only Makoto doesn't mind dying. He'd rather die entertained in battle than live in boredom. In fact, Yukito hired some investigators to look into Makoto's background. Ever since he was a child, he excelled at everything that he did, so found life boring and without challenge. On top of that, his parents abandoned him for some reason, I guess because they feared him. But yielding the Zero Suit is the greatest challenge he's ever had to face. But Top Gala and the Stegosliden turn their backs on Abare Killer and he's left on his own. And the Giganoid that Michaela and Voffa create for him is actually a trap in order to free the other form of Desmo through the use of a tree similar to the one in which Rija slept at the Evolian base. The Rangers find out about this as they're able to capture and interrogate Makoto's monster butler, Telefatsendile, who is low-key the forgotten gem of this series. But even when he's inside, Makoto just thinks he's in a Giganoid, not the means of Desmo's revival. But soon enough, the Giganoid is trapped inside of a Tree of Life. The idea is that the fusion of both parts of Desmo and the two Trees of Life, one on Dino Earth at the Evolian base and one on another Earth, would mean that Desmo's power would be strong enough to unleash countless monsters from the fruit that the tree bears. Whereas up until now, Michaela and Voffa have been limited to only using one at a time because there isn't enough power. Which, to be fair, despite its complicated backstory, is a decent enough explanation as to why there's only one monster of the week, rather than loads that get unleashed on Earth at one time. Again, something that Power Rangers doesn't really bother to try and explain. Top Gala reappears because he doesn't feel he can abandon Makoto. So at this point he sides with the Rangers. Asuka goes inside Stega Sliden and Top Gala merges with him to form Killer O, but this time under the Black Ranger's control. After combining with some of the auxiliary dinosaurs, he's able to hold off some of the monsters, while the Rangers blow a hole in the Tree of Life and enter, going after Makoto. But Desmo has already begun to be revived, with roots sprouting throughout the world, and Makoto under his control. 
Ryogo is able to reach Makoto because he still refuses to kill the man that saved his life, despite it potentially meaning that the world could be destroyed. He convinces him that the malice inside of him was Desmo all along, and Rajul even turns up to confirm it because she actually really loves him. She's still evil and still wants him to do evil too, but she can't face sacrificing him. So I guess love conquers all. Filled with rage at being used as a pawn, Makoto transforms one more time and escapes the tree with Top Gala, thwarting Desmo's return. While he has no intention of becoming good, he agrees to fight alongside the rangers, and Top Gala even merges with Aberenno to form Grand Aberenno, with all five rangers inside, which is like Killer Aberenno, but more. There's just so many different forms of Zord in this show, but I kind of like it now. I think in Power Rangers I had a problem with it because they started to feel like just throwaway gadgets, just accessories to Megazord. But in Aberanger, we've had 43 episodes of developing each dinosaur's individual personalities rather than just being robots, and they are all different, and they're used in more variations than they are in Power Rangers 2, so you really understand and appreciated why each thing is doing what it's doing, even though it's incredibly hard to summarise it all. But of course, this isn't the end. Desmo's other form inside of Rajul is reawakened when he senses his other half. But they're in the weird situation that they can't let Makoto die because they need the body that houses Desmo's other half to survive, which means that Desmo is actively stopping the Dynaminder reaching its limits. The only one that could kill him would be Desmo's other half, only Rajul fights it as she couldn't allow Makoto to be killed by her own hands. Now, there's always some filler before the finale, and it usually involves a clip show to try and bring people up to speed if they've missed anything throughout the season. Although in Aberanger, they do a nice twist on it, where it's presented like none of it has been real, and that they actually all have dull lives, and the entire thing has just been a fantasy creation to escape the mundanity of life. And actually, Asuka is engaged to Ranru, so the whole thing with Mahoro is kind of like a fantasy affair in his dreams, and Evolian is just the name of a sober place, with Makoto as the delivery guy. When in reality, everything that we've seen so far was the real world, but the rangers were trapped in a collective dream for the duration of this episode, and this episode alone. And it was all caused by Telefatsendile springing a trap to escape before an horrific death. However, none of that was real, because the whole thing was happening inside Telefatsendal's dream. And you thought Inception was hard to understand. Now, it's weird, but it's one of the few clip shows I've actually really enjoyed watching. As we get towards the end of the season, Mahoro manages to sneak a message to the Rangers, saying that the way to defeat Desmo is through the combining of all five powers. In doing so, a miraculous light will appear. Which leaves Makoto in a dilemma, because if Desmo is defeated and he's transformed into Abare Killer, he risks killing himself and taking many people with him, just as he's starting to embrace his own humanity, won over by the Ranger's kindness and the sheer impossible cuteness of Mai. Seriously, how is she this cute? But Desmo isn't fooled, restraining Mahoro and transforming Rajul into a monster, who just happens to have unnecessarily large armour boobs and bejeweled nipples. Either way, Abare Killer finally becomes part of the Aberanger lineup. This prompts the young girl to announce that she has to leave, and oh god, Mai's crying. It turns out that this girl was the miraculous light all along. She manages to expel Desmo from Rajul, and this allows her to return to Rija, and then to the form of a baby, Mahoro's baby. But Desmo has to inhabit a body, so enters Mahoro and then disappears, leaving the baby with Asuka. Although he rejects Mahoro's body, merging Michaela and Voffa, temporarily inhabiting them instead. It turns out that the body waiting for him is Bakaren O, the muted coloured version of Aberen O, which we saw in the Frozen Summer movie. Now, technically, we didn't need to know what happens in the movie for this to make sense, but Ski makes reference to seeing them before, and if you'd just been watching the show, you'd think you'd missed an episode, but 
you haven't, it was actually something completely separate. Desmo takes Makoto into Baccarat O and attempts to merge his two forms, but Makoto fights back and is powered up by the other ranger's dino guts, destroying Desmo's other form, and then Baccarat O is destroyed. Again. But that means that Makoto no longer has the protection of Desmo, and as such, he dies. He refuses to transform for a final time, knowing that the Dino Minder is close to exploding, but Top Gala promised to stay by his side until the end, so sacrifices himself and carries Makoto into space, away from where the explosion can do anyone harm. What's left of Desmo returns to the Tree of Life on Dino Earth, and transports the Evolian base to this Earth, turning it into a monster, and planning to turn the planet into a desert like they did on Dino Earth. Mahoro is still captured inside, but tells Asuka that if he truly loves her, then he must destroy the monster regardless of whether she's inside or not. But of course he ignores that and goes after her anyway. But while she thinks that she's going to die, she reminisces back to the things that we saw earlier in the season. But it's not a clip show. We learn things like Gaiatan actually begged Janna to kill him so that the armour would pass to her and no one else. Ranru also goes after them both, while Yukito pilots Max Oja. Asuka is able to free Mahoro, but the Armour of Darkness is conjured up by Desmo, which nearly kills them both, but Ryuga is able to save them all with Abba Reno. In one final rampage, Desmo is destroyed, but he takes Ryuga, Yukito, Abareno, and Max Oja with him, and oh god, Mai's crying again. But of course they're not all dead. We skip forward six months, and Ski goes back to work with Telefats and Dahl as his new waiter, Ranru becomes a racing driver, Emmy is Yukito's secretary and friends with the baseball player we saw earlier in the series. Ryuga has moved to America with Mai, and she's now somehow even cuter because she's speaking English. Your English has really improved, my chan Of course it has. It's been six months. But it's not really clear how they survived. Essentially, they just dug underground to avoid the explosion, which, considering how complicated this series has been, feels kind of weak. But we do have to say some goodbyes. Asuka and Mahoro return to Dino Earth with their daughter, who they name after Makoto, but all of the dinosaurs also return to their homes to rebuild their world. And then, just for good measure, a load of characters turn up at the restaurant that look just like all of the characters we just said goodbye to throughout the show. But it doesn't end there. There's loads of other Aberranger episodes. I'm not going to touch on all of the anniversary comebacks, because even without them, there's still a lot, and this is already mind-bogglingly complicated. We've already talked about the movie, and also the Surabakanishi episodes, but there's also an Abba Ranger super video called All Dinosaur Laugh Out Loud Battle, which is a video that has activities for children, as well as clips from throughout the season, although it was released while the show was still on the air. It's presented by the Rangers and all of the dinosaurs, and also features a battle between Abareno and Baccarano, although obviously this isn't part of the continuation of the TV show's story, so it isn't canon. I think. And then there's also the Dino Guts video, which is a fourth wall breaking episode which gives an overview of the Rangers' powers, abilities, and weapons. It also takes a moment to plug the toys, which I definitely want, and is basically just a mini clip show. Then there's the spoken word drama CD, the Dino Guts CD, but even after all of that, there's still two crossovers one with the season before and after Aberranger. The first is a crossover with Nimpu Sentai Hurricanja, the season that came before Aberranger, and is set relatively late in the season of Aberranger. Ski and Emmy are alerted to a Giganoid, and the Rangers go to investigate, forming Abareno and Max Ryuo. But of course, they're not Giganoids, they're the mechs from Hurricanja although they are being controlled by someone other than the Rangers. They identify themselves as Apostles, as in Aberranger, but they're not Apostles of Desmo, and they're not Saurians either. They're Hurricanger villains that now have seemingly become Evolians. Following an explosion in that series, they are sent hurtling into another dimension, arriving in Dino Earth. 
The Evolians gifted them with a jewel that was able to seal away an infernal king called Eager on Dino Earth. They break the jewel to release him where he begins to rampage, which brings the Hurricane Rangers back to their aid, but the Rangers are all stepping on each other's toes. Eager then sends out multiple versions of himself to do his bidding, who are even able to block their ability to transform. But after they learn to work together, the two teams of Rangers manage to defeat the copies. The rest of the Evolians turn up to back up the original Ego, which leads to the epic crossover morph sequence and the combination of powers. Some of which are a bit questionable, but either way, the inevitable mech fight follows, along with more characters from Hurricanja until Ego is defeated and everyone does the Abba Ranger dance. And then after that, there's also the crossover with Takusa Sentai Deca Ranger, which is the equivalent of our Power Rangers crossover with SBD. Although there's not the same time travel element as in Power Rangers. The Deca Rangers are called to an emergency as the Abba Rangers are supposedly rampaging downtown. They're chasing a raven, but end up arrested and taken to the Deca Ranger base, where they too have a canine commander. But the costume is much closer to something out of a furry's wet dream than in the US show. And that's even before Yukito gets him half naked and starts cracking his back. The raven is actually a shape-shifting monster, and the rangers must work together to defeat him. What's interesting is that all of a sudden they bring back the idea that Ranru is a genius, that they seem to drop pretty quickly and never really brought up again until this moment. But it forms quite an important part of this episode, with Ranru breaking out all sorts of tech that we haven't seen before. The monster is supposed to be one of Michaela's trinoids, but they mix in the monsters from Deca Ranger as well, breaking the fourth wall a little bit when they consult a book on Abba Ranger to read about how trinoids function. They head out to meet Ski, whose curry place is now a franchise with a huge Skyrise headquarters. And it's also mentioned that Mai has been scouted by Hollywood as a child actress, because of course she has, she's impossibly cute. Only Ski is no longer the owner, Tella Fatsendahl has taken over and is now his boss and president of the company, because like I mentioned, he's one of the best characters from the show. He had a jewel in his office that contained the monster, but it was recently stolen. A monster then turns up and steals some more items from his office, but this time to revive, who else, but Desmo. Various battles break out, eventually prompting Asuka to return from Dino Earth and join the fight. And they do actually bother to explain how he got back, which is not something you expect from a show like this. But throughout the Aberrager season, the means of transporting from Dino Earth to our Earth is usually through a kiss from Rija. It turns out that Asuka and Mahoro's daughter, Makoto, not that Makoto, inherited this power and was able to send her dad back. But it wasn't just a coincidence, as she was able to sense that the other Earth was in danger. And you know where this is going. It's headed for the all-out battle. But how? All the dinosaurs are gone too. Right? Wrong. Top Gala turns up, despite us thinking he'd been blown up with Makoto, and then Makoto turns up too. But they do explain it. The monsters that stole the nuts from Telefats and Dao's office were meant to use it to revive the strongest of the Evolians, but they didn't quite get it right, and rather than reviving Desmo, they revived Makoto and Top Gala. Then we get the inevitable all-out battle, but what about the other dinosaurs? Oh, you better believe they're back too, presumably sent by Asuka's daughter, and with that, the bad guys are done for. With the battle over and the monsters defeated, Makoto is unable to stay and his spirit disappears once more. And it all ends with the women taking a bath together, which comes out of nowhere, but I'm not complaining. So essentially, it's nothing like the SBD crossover at all, and it actually goes to the effort of covering potential plot holes. I'm genuinely impressed. They even show Mai in America, Emmy now a practicing chiropractor after being Yukito's secretary, and Mahoro turns up at the end with little Makoto for the curry party. We even see the Rija and Rajul actresses playing waitresses. So at the end of it all, Abba Ranger is nothing like Dino Thunder, but it is in itself brilliant. 
There's a couple of similar episodes, but generally speaking, even characters that appear in the US show are very different to the Japanese show. For example, Goldenrod, Zeltrax's son, is a completely different type of character in Abba Ranger. It's actually a Giganoid that's disguised as a popular kids' TV hero called Galaxian Egrek, I think. And then being a Giganoid, he only appears in giant form. And unlike some seasons we've watched so far, there's very few mirrored episodes. Dino Thunder was great, but Abba Ranger feels much more like a substantial season. Everything is just more fleshed out. But unlike what has happened in some seasons, it's not bogged down with too many continuity-breaking mistakes. This is the first time where I felt that, even though the storyline is incredibly complicated, just about everything was well thought out. The humour's great too. In one episode, the Tyrannosaurus gets angry at Abba Red for taking too long to take down the bad guys because he left Mai on her own at daycare. So he takes matters into his own hands, picking him up and flinging him all the way across town to meet her, knocking down a bunch of dominoes in the process. Although granted the slapstick is a bit much here. But there's other things, like the pterodactyl going missing, and when they try to form Abareno, she's not there, so they fight with another form of Abareno that they just call Abaren Almost. Which I don't know if that's the official name or that's just what the translator came up with, but either way that's just objectively brilliant. And then there's the New Year's episode, where the humans are all feasting and the dinosaurs are all playing board games arguing with each other while Telefatsundal gets drunk on sake. It's just charming. It's silly and childish in parts, but it's not overdone. There's also an episode where Ranru dresses up as a sexy police officer and then starts doing gymnastics, which has nothing to do with anything, I just wanted to bring it up. Hashtag you're welcome dads. At this point, I don't think I've seen a series of either Power Rangers or Super Sentai where individual Zors are utilised as much as they are in Abba Ranger. They get loads of screen time outside of the Megazord form. They all have their own personalities and they all talk with the Rangers constantly. They're not just mech that the Rangers can use, they're teammates too. But what's interesting is that they have conversations amongst themselves as well, and the special effects are actually quite good considering what you're Essentially watching at this point is just a bunch of hand puppets. These types of shots are also used when the dinosaurs talk to the rangers, both via their communicators and also in the restaurant come command centre. I guess what better way to sell toys than have them be transforming robots, talking dinosaurs, and members of the team. I mean, there's even an episode where the Triceratops gets turned into a human after making a wish. But generally speaking, having so many practical effects also means that you're not as focused on the CG as you are in Power Rangers. One thing I did notice though is that there's very little emphasis on the grunts, or putty-like characters, in Abba Ranger. Dino Thunder has a mix of the Tyranodrones and the Triptoids, the latter being Zeltrax's foot soldiers, but Abba Ranger only really has the Barmia soldiers, the equivalent of the Triptoids, and, well, they're rubbish with the weird little gallop into battle. But honestly, you don't really see that much of them, especially compared to something like the Yatato in Ginga Man or Putties in Mighty Morphin Power Rangers that make prominent appearances in just about every episode. The only thing that kind of grated on me is that the base for the Rangers is Ski's Curry Restaurant, which essentially needs to be empty most of the time in order for it to function as a base. So for the majority of the show, it doesn't actually feel like it's a restaurant at all. Only occasionally will it look like they have any customers, other than Mr. Yoki, that is. Aside from the TV show, though, there's also the video games. In the West, we actually got two different versions of the Dino Thunder game. There's a Game Boy Advance game, which is nothing special, it's just a fairly generic non-linear platforming beat-em-up, in which I just jump around for ages not knowing where to go. And then there's the console version, which is completely different. While there's some fairly decent cutscenes, albeit not voiced by the original actors, the game is pretty poor. It's just a 3D platformer that's mostly set in a tar pit, and you only really use the Zords. I can just about stomach playing up until the point you have to play a Superman 64-like level in the Pterodactyl. 
There may be more to it, but I haven't got the patience to find out. Oddly though, there was no ABBA Ranger game released for the current generation of consoles. Instead, like Mega Ranger, Japan got a Sega Pico exclusive. Unfortunately, I can't tell you too much about it because Sega Pico games are edutainment and very text-heavy Japanese. But not only that, you also require an actual cartridge with a book attachment to know what's going on. But as mentioned, the bottom line is Dino Thunder and Abba Ranger are nothing alike. But they're both great seasons, possibly my new favourites, so absolutely give them some time. Especially if you grew up with the original Mighty Morphin Dinosaurs as your era of Power Rangers. There's not a huge amount to compare with that season, but the US show does actually feel like a proper spiritual successor to that season. Now then, there's only one way to end this, isn't there? <laughs>